Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So gas prices are, you know, like almost at an all-time high, if not an all-time high, at least a recent high. And, uh, and you know, I heard a, uh, a guy on, uh, on CNN today that uh, was talking about what's happening if uh, the American, um, American uh, constraints against Russia get imposed. And he was saying that gas prices will be higher than they've ever been before. And yeah. uh, he was almost looking forward to that, which I was a little surprised. So I thought I would check in with Dan McTagg, who is president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. Lots of you will know him from uh, uh, gaspricewizard.com. He was a member of parliament in the House of Commons. He was a public relations specialist in the past. And he's someone that knows more about gas prices than anyone I know of. Dan, how are you? Welcome to our show. Uh, good to be here. Wish it was on telling people prices are low, but then again, they wouldn't really mind. Uh, but I just had my daughter-in-law uh, text me a few minutes ago. Um, she's heading down to Chatham and uh, was shocked that her little fuel efficient uh, three cylinder uh, Ford Bronco for her husband, herself and her young one uh, cost her $90 when she bought the vehicle uh, several months ago, it would never cost her more than about uh, $48, $49. So she's, uh, she's still reeling from the shock. So what's going on? Well, number of factors, um, most of all, uh, the real effects of a shortage in oil supply globally. Uh, demand is picking up and supply of oil is no longer there. And those who are supplying it uh, are either uh, at maximum production capacity, have very little in the way of spare capacity, and certainly have no money uh, to go out and uh, find new uh, wells or new discoveries to replace what we're using now. So it's created, uh, and, and the markets, I think, are very, very slow to this, uh, but it's created a reality that uh, we're dealing with uh, what could be the beginnings of a pretty significant uh, energy bubble, super bubble. Some refer to it as an energy crisis, depending where you are in the world. Uh, Europe would be a good example where prices there are substantially higher. Um, if you go to Asia, you'll find uh, concerns about uh, about uh, fertilizers, nitrogen, urea, which is derived from, from, from diesel. What it means for Canadians and why we've seen now record prices at $1.53.9 at most gas stations here this morning uh, is that we're entering a new period uh, in which uh, prices are likely to remain uh, extraordinarily high and even higher uh, as uh, no one really has additional supplies. So uh, coming out of the pandemic, Demand has surged and supply has uh, slumped. And uh, between the two, uh, and the, you can actually, Brian, calibrate what that is. It's about 2.5 million barrels short a day. No one seems to have any spare capacity. And that's why we're going to see oil move even higher over the next couple of weeks, possibly to $100 a barrel. Worse for us here in Canada, the weakness in the Canadian dollar, which traditionally has protected us when we had the petrodollar. Uh, that's no longer the case. So I was out in Alberta recently on business and spoke with a lot of people and they were saying actually the companies are flush with cash because of high prices. They're making um, you know, huge amounts of money, but because of uh, climate change issues and, uh, and COP26 and, uh, and, and uh, you know, issues about carbon taxes, et cetera, they're using all that extra money to pay down debt and, yeah, uh, and, yeah. and declare dividends and are not doing any exploration, no CapEx almost whatsoever, other than CapEx associated with carbon capture and alternative energy and things like that. And so, uh, you know, they were saying that no one's looking for, for, for increased supply. Yeah. And why would you, uh, if you have a government that goes around and, and a world that seems to be saying we can do more with less, uh, which is something we always want. Uh, but a world that's now saying, hang on a second here, maybe we were a little too rushed in our idea that we could make the green transition. I mentioned during Europe earlier where natural gas prices are four times the height where uh, countries like uh, Germany are now cranking out uh, more coal power where they've shut down uh, the uh, natural gas production within their own limits. I think what this really says is, uh, and it, it's, it's a marker, not just in terms of how these companies are behaving, but uh, I'm not an investor in oil, never have been, but I find it interesting to say the least that uh, when I look at the valuation of an average Canadian company in the, in the energy sector prior to 2014, that's when Saudi Arabia decided to flood the world with uh, oil uh, as a means of you know, shaking down the US uh, uh, frackers. Um, I look at valuation of a lot of companies where what, you know, five times what they are today, even though the price of oil 
is back to a very, very sustainable level. So yes, they're keeping the cash. They're not reinvesting it. Um, and the markets are still doing this sort of shrug thing. I think we've hit a point where uh, markets and those uh, who are involved in uh, so-called ESG mandates, uh, environment, social and governance mandates, are going to have to think long and hard about the idea that we can simply turn off a switch or turn on a switch and shift over to solar power and uh, uh, EVs and, uh, and of course, uh, windmills, mostly because reality is pushing a very pushing us in a very different direction. It's really grounding us to the fact that uh, we don't have yet the ability to replace uh, the heft, the reliability, uh, the interchangeability uh, of uh, some of our fossil fuels, which are still very much at the center of, uh, of our economy. And so, uh, you know, unsurprisingly that, uh, you know, many uh, investors are not putting money in oil and gas. You hear, you know, media one after another, oh, you know, Desjardins insurance, we're not putting any money. It's all clean tech. The problem is, and we're seeing this here in Ontario, um, you know, Quebec doesn't have, for instance, a significant amount of hydro that it can spare in the winter. In fact, over the past, well, the past month, Quebec has borrowed a lot of hydro from Ontario. Much of that produced by, drum roll please, natural gas. So look, I, I, we're, off the, we're a little on the, off the map here, but the, the fact is that the energy, I think, is, uh, has lost uh, a lot of respect. It feels a little bit like rotting danger field uh, uh, some days, but I think it's coming back with a vengeance. And those who ignore it, uh, those who think we can wish these things away and go to another climate conference and pretend uh, uh, that the world can get by without fossil fuels, I mean, in a word, Brian, are delusional and dangerously so. Delusional and dangerously so. Dan, how did you get in this uh, business? You you were a liberal member of parliament, and now you um, you know are one of the top voices on uh, on gas prices. How did you I get into the oil this companies? Yeah, I fought the oil companies when I was a member of parliament on their behavior and competitive behavior against independent gas retailers. It happened when. Uh, a family uh, in my constituency had lost their business because they were being squeezed by their supplier, uh, the vertically integrated supplier who opened up across the street and uh, decided to do them in. In any other jurisdiction, uh, United States, Australia, Britain, that would have been seen as, uh, you know, brazen uh, examples of anti-competitive behaviors. But in Canada, the Competition Act was rewritten by those it was meant to serve. So I spent a considerable amount of time on this issue and in the process understood how uh, the industry prices, and of course, not just oil and gas, but also electricity and many others. And I came in at a very good time. I was a Liberal Member of Parliament when provincially we all were also in power. Uh, many of my friends were at Queen's Park. Um, some have since moved past away, but had uh, you know very prominent roles to play and were able to, as it were, demonstrate where the changes were taking place. And of course, the big one was the Green Energy Act of uh, 19, F20, 2009, 2010. Um, between all of this, you know, and experiences that I had pushing consumer issues, I guess uh, I figured out a way in which to produ- provide people a prediction on gas prices. And that really allowed folks to understand that uh, if there's anybody in this country who understands how this industry operates, when it's acting right, when it's not, Uh, I'll be that person. And um, my job has always been even after politics. Uh, When I left politics, or as the expression goes, it left me uh, to continue to help people, at least uh, on that front. And it was important because it, uh, over the years, uh, with volatility in the markets, you know, it could save people a lot of money by knowing where the price was going a few days later. What's happened now, however, is that I've always said I want to come after this industry from a competitive perspective. I've never set out to kill this industry. And uh, I think the narrative, the political narrative in this country has changed. Uh, and, and Brian, we've had the opportunity uh, to perhaps take for granted uh, natural gas and oil. Uh, I think those days are coming to an end only because the price was cheap, jobs were abundant, pipelines could be filled with fuel, and uh, the United States was always a willing buyer. I think that's all coming to an end now. And uh, realities of a government that uh, has uh, significant financial exposure as a result of COVID pre and post is going to make things a little different. So I continue down that road of, uh, you know, trying to help people, but also uh, remain informed. It's a, it's a, it's a dynamic and wonderful area of uh, economic policy. I want to show you a chart if I could um, that tracks inflation and, uh, and interest rates. And uh, you know, inflation is not up just because of gas prices, but inflation 
is up dramatically, uh, people say, because of supply chain um, uh, challenges right now because of wage price inflation and because of energy uh, prices. Um, and interest rates are still at an all-time low. And a lot of people are saying because of inflation above 5% for the first time really in a decade. And the first time inflation, um, other than uh, you know during the, the global financial collapse, has been up above 5% really this millennium. Um, you know, it, it was the 1990s when it was uh, up uh, high like this. People are saying that the Bank of Canada, the central banks in the United States, around the world, are going to have to increase inflation and interest rates uh, dramatically to bring down inflation. Um, and it's not going to be gas prices, oil prices that are the way that it's going to come down. It's going to be through interest rate increases that could lead to stagflation. What do you think? What's going to happen to the global marketplace if inflation in energy supply chain and uh, and wages stay this high, wow! I mean, that's uh, some pretty heady stuff. Let me put it back to the in the Canadian context because it's important to start there. I think uh, we're a nation that's blessed for the abundance of energy, uh, cheap, affordable energy, uh, and we found ways to drive those prices up. Uh, my concern emanates from the economic problems that uh, Canada is facing. When you exclude residential uh, investments, capital, you wind up in effect with a, a rather alarming scenario in which not just oil and gas, but manufacturing, many other sectors are in decline. Uh, we don't seem to be able to attract investments in Canada beyond you know, housing. And uh, I think there, when I look at that chart, what makes me nervous like anyone else is if what happens if interest rates go back to the good old days, um, when we were, you know, uh, in the early 1990s, mid 1990s, uh, dealing with 12% uh, inflation uh, interest rates, I don't suspect it would take that much to uh, to upset the apple cart. Uh, but the relationship between uh, inflation and interest rates, uh, I think, are simply that the banks, central banks, through active purchase of assets. Uh, which our bank has become very involved in, especially on mortgages, um, while not considering the impact of uh, losing, you know, a, a, the attraction of the country at a time in which the world is going to need more minerals, more resources, more of our raw material, um, creates an opportunity, but also creates a frightening scenario if we keep blocking it by saying it doesn't meet a certain green standard, we're done. Um, I think if inflation starts to rear its ugly head, and I was around in 1981, 82, my first break uh, as a youngster was working for a guy named Paul Cosgrove, who was the Minister of Housing, actually Public Works responsible for CMHC, and uh, had the kind of uh, unusual uh, you know, experience of working for the Minister of Housing at a time in which we had 22, 23% interest rates in the summer of August of uh, 1981, while my father, a home builder, was losing his shirt. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of re rhetoric to convince me of how important that relationship is. And although monetary theory has changed, banks have changed their, their, their central banks have changed their perspective when it comes to monetary policy. I, I think the fact that uh, there has to inevitably be, and it's led by the Fed in the United States, several increases uh, over the next several months or several quarters, I think is going to uh, fully expose Canada to the uh, problems uh, once it loses its mojo, as it were, on housing, there isn't a whole lot to fall back on. I don't see a lot of growth potential out there. And I see a government's uh, federal, provincial, municipal, who are going to be hard pressed to uh, making ends meet, tying, uh, you know, tying uh, the loose ends and uh, make sure they honor the debts they've accumulated, along with public debt, which is extraordinarily high. We've got public debt at an all time high. We've got uh... Personal uh, uh, debt at an all-time high, uh, mainly because of real estate investment and that uh, that sector that you talked about. Um, we've got uh, people's exposure to variable interest rates at an all-time high, such that if uh, short-term interest rates go up the way that you know I think they're happening, and it sounds like you think they're going to happen, um, and lots of people in the marketplace think is going to happen, um, what's going to happen? Well, I think a lot of people are going to find themselves having to make choices. They're doing that already now, Brian. The fact that uh, energy prices are in part driving the supply chain issue, 
energy prices are, are not a, uh, you know, a condition or a symptom. They're actually part of the bigger picture. If we're going to start to see individuals uh, having to manage, you know, 30% increases in energy costs to heat uh, and to eat. 30% uh, increases well, if you look in over energy the past costs. year since the pandemic, we've, we've been up. Uh, when I say 30%, I'm not referring to this, you know, Bank of Canada or Stats Can coming out saying, oh, five to 7%. If one goes back to the beginning of the pandemic and compares prices then to now, they're going to find that whether it's used cars, housing, uh, take your big ticket items, fuel, they're all above thirty percent. Well, fuel was, you know, it, it, you know, I think people were talking about uh, that uh, that almost it was a negative uh, uh, prices for fuel at some point in time in 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 March, April of twenty twenty. April twenty twenty minus thirty six point six minus thirty seven point six three dollars a barrel. And at that point in time, everyone thought everyone was going to stay home forever and, and gas would uh, would be the worst possible investment. And, and things have changed since then. Yeah, well, demand is there now. It's, uh, it's coming back with a vengeance and it doesn't have to come from North America. The demand is being driven by what's happening uh, external to uh, the West, Western world. Uh, the Chinas, the Indias, uh, uh, emerging nations are surging uh, in their desire to get back on track and to... Uh, as to, as it were to uh, to uh, to get access to uh, energy and so I say thirty percent because of course just a year ago now Brian we were paying a buck thirteen at the pumps you're now paying a buck fifty three so forty cents uh, a little bit more than thirty percent and that's only this year wait till the end of the year is finished and we go through all these carbon taxes and, and clean fuel standard uh, and the Canadian dollar which is relevant to all of this that you the chart you just showed uh, which is weakening. Now, in the face of higher oil prices, in the past, we saw the Canadian dollar come very close to the value of the U.S. greenback, by which we price all of our commodities. Critical people understand this. It's not just gasoline. Anything you use, anything you buy is priced in U.S. dollars. We all understand that, but a lot of people don't. And in the past, when we saw $88 a barrel, $87 a barrel of w, uh, WTI and you know a $10 uh, discount for Western Canadian Select, we always saw the Canadian dollar very close to its value, to the U.S. value, sometimes exceeding it, sometimes just being behind this. The fact that it isn't is adding a layer of Why debt is it not? or a layer of inflation. Well, no, who wants to buy the Canadian dollar? you got nothing to offer. Yes, we have your oil, but we'd have no more oil pi pipeline capacity. We, we've, we've shut down Energy East. We've shut down Northern Gateway, our ability to get our number one export. And it is our number one. And it, by the way, it generates a whack of cash for governments, federal, provincial, municipal. I mean, they may navel gaze and come around and say, oh, we should shut down natural gas plants. But they have to be very, very careful here not to bite the hand that literally feeds them. In the past 20 years, and it's not my stats, it's <laughs> we've worked on this for many, many years. Um, you know, the net, uh, you know, um, revenues derived from the oil and gas sector to the Canadian and other governments is in excess of 20, that's two zero billion a year. Now, if you think you can, we, we think we can just walk away from that, good luck, especially at a time when you're having to pay debt. But the Canadian dollar is fundamentally weak by the fact that it has nothing to attract. No one's converting their rupees or their uh, bats or their US dollars into Canadian dollars the way they did before. And that's creating uh, uh, an unusual circumstance in which the purchasing power of Canadians is literally being thrown out the window long before the interest rates start to go up. So I think we're in a... I think we're in a whole heap of trouble. And I think the Bank of Canada knows that. I just wish that our uh, folks uh, and our successors in Ottawa would understand that because clearly they're not doing a very good job at balancing a checkbook, notwithstanding COVID and what they had to do. I think the fact that we were in this pickle and in this soup well before the pandemic with a shutdown of the economy, with pipeline blockages, all these things are going to start to come back and people are going to expect their government to do more at precisely the time in which it has to do a lot less. We're chatting tonight with Dan McTague, president at Canadians for Affordable Energy. We're talking about uh, primarily gas prices, but the implication of those uh, dramatically increased uh, gas prices on inflation, on interest, on the economy, on government and policymaking. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments. I'm going to ask Dan what he thinks we need to do. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm having a really fun time tonight chatting with Dan McTague, who is president at Canadians for Affordable Energy. 
Dan was a, uh, a liberal MP and uh, had some exposure to him uh, when he was a liberal MP and found him to be one of the smartest guys you'd want to meet um, and very knowledgeable on lots of different issues, uh, but uh, particularly, obviously, on energy policy, because that's something that he's really dedicated a lot of his, uh, his career to understanding gas prices and the like. Uh, Dan, you've... Um, You've described uh, dramatic increases in uh, gas prices, and uh, you've said that some of it is because of over attention to, you know, climate change, and 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 because of that, uh, uh, cut downs of uh, of pipeline capacity, not building pipeline capacity. Um, I've had a couple of people on my show that have said that uh, Western alienation is really at an all time high and is a real risk. And uh, and and actually, one gentleman last week called uh, the Laurentian solitude. Um, uh, completely divorced from the realities of, of Western Canada and not understanding what's going on and not understanding um, the oil and gas business and how critically important it was to Canada. Um, you've been critical about what the government is currently doing, and it's a liberal government. Uh, you used to be a liberal member of parliament. Tell me, if you were the prime minister of Canada today, or maybe minister of finance or minister of energy, what do you think we need to do? I think we uh, need to have a reassessment uh, of the priorities of the nation. What are the engines that grow the economy to get us back up on our feet? And what are the things that could most do, do most damage to the economy? And I would expect that, although we have obligations and it may have a wonderful, you know, opportunity to, you know, uh, break open the Perrier and have, uh, you know, swell down some canapes at the same time in international forum, the reality is I think for Canadians, uh, uh, affordability is going to become a major, if it isn't already, a major concern, a growing concern. I think the federal government has to back off on uh, regulations, on climate taxes, uh, and on other complicating taxes, uh, which no climate economist would support. That is a clean fuel standard on top of a carbon tax, on top of regulations. I think it's doing untold damage to the economy. So I would suggest the federal government consider a moratorium. I would also consider that they suggest that they would take, uh, given the co rising cost of energy and the amount of uh, revenues federal provincial governments are receiving by virtue of the HST being applied to a much higher price, in, in, you know, compounding the misery for, for, for hard-pressed Canadians coming out of the pandemic, trying to get back on their feet. The federal government is probably going to wind up with a billion dollars in extra cash that it, uh, that it doesn't need, and the provincial government's probably about the same. I would think that a rebate would be in order. And uh, I don't just talk about that in terms of, you know, the potential. Um, Brian, you'll recall I did it twice uh, under Jean Chrétien and uh, uh, the first Paul Martin government where we were able to get uh, GST energy rebates back to Canadians. I think when I'm getting emails from people saying I am having a hard time making it and know that the government, uh, you know, uh, uh, government supports for our seniors, for those that are less well off, continue to dwindle. I suspect that uh, the idea that uh, we can have a national daycare program, which is a wonderful idea, is neither affordable and for many people misses the point. So a moratorium on, uh, on, on climate uh, objectives, because I think they're hurting Canada uniquely, specifically, uh, raising the rate of inflation, raising the cost of living and damaging our number one economic engines, uh, oil and gas and manufacturing. And at the same time, just uh, provide Canadians with a rebate at a time in which they need it most. But don't we need to do all that if uh, climate change is a real issue and we need to, to wean ourselves from, uh, from a carbon-based economy? I think we're doing that. And we've been doing it for a long time. Ontario de developed hydro long before it's trendy 100 years ago. I represented a riding in Pickering that was the first commercial use of uh, nuclear reactors uh, back in the 1960s, early 70s. Uh, we don't give ourselves enough credit the fact that we are leaders in terms of uh, you know, uh, dropping the amount of emissions from our uh, from our oil sands or from our natural gas production, uh, our methane. We're, there's no one that compares to Canada uh, and is subject to the rigors that Canadian uh, producers are. I think we're going to go down that road. I worked in the automotive sector earlier in Toyota. I mean, development of new technologies will get us there. But for the governments and politicians to act in a for a demagogue, you know, in, 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 as demagogues and saying we can make this happen and establish these arbitrary numbers on 2030 or 2035, or you know, we're going to wind up with um, being able to borrow six trillion dollars to electrify to 80 percent to achieve net zero 2050. I think these are all goals, and they're, they're laudable. But to impose them 
has enormous devastating consequences for a country like Canada on a day like today, in which we're experiencing unusually and record level cold uh, for a lot of Canadians in a time in which we're trying to get the economy back up and running. I think we're, Canada's doing a great job. I'm not suggesting we should let up for a second, but I also think we have to be realistic. You're going to lose a lot of people on your climate objectives if at the end of the day, they can neither heat nor eat nor get a job and watch their future deteriorate. And that's what's happening in Canada right now. The frustration that we saw on the weekend wasn't just a bunch of wackos showing up in Ottawa to protest. It is a metaphor for the bigger frustration that Canadians are feeling. And if our politicians of all political stripes are insensitive to this, well, they'll be shown the door very, very soon. Are you worried about Western alienation? Very much so. I'm not from the West. I don't spend uh, a lot of time out there. Uh, I get a lot of people texting me, tweeting, et cetera. Oh, it's very real. And uh, I suspect that uh, a raw deal is, uh, you know, one region of the country seems to be doing very well via equalization. Another one is, uh, is, uh, is footing the bill. I think that's, uh, you know, a need for a rebalance. I don't think it's fair. Uh, Ontario has always been the sort of traditionally, uh, historically, in my uh, wonder uh, of great interest in Canadian history, has always benefited from, you know, uh, the West and the uh, and Quebec and the Maritimes being the center. I suspect that when Ontario starts to, uh, you know, to, to see hard times, um, I think there'd be more legitimacy, at least more understanding of the frustration, uh, particularly in the oil uh, producing natural gas producing regions of the country, including the central part of British Columbia, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. So I'm sensitive to it. I'm sympathetic to it. Uh, we all want to be Canadians, but uh, if I were, uh, you know, if the same thing were to happen to Ontario uh, or the same thing were to happen to Quebec, the fur would fly and there wouldn't be such thing as an alienation. We'd be, we'd be bending over backwards. So they have every right to be uh, concerned. My biggest problem is I don't think the current group of liberals uh, who have, in my view, played very, you know, tactical games of virtue signaling and uh, uh, divide and conquer. Uh, I think believe this prime minister is probably the most divisive prime minister we have seen. And, and it's uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, you and I both know him. Uh, I, I can tell you with absolute certainty that uh, a change at the top would probably help this party and help this country alleviate some of those problems and get fresh perspective on uh, the needs for Canadians, especially those who feel that they're getting a raw deal from Canada. You talked about uh, the, the the truck convoy protests in Ottawa, uh, and you said they're not a bunch of wackos. Um, you know, it's interesting, some conservative politicians like Pierre Poly Polyev uh, embraced them, uh, Maxime Bernier, uh, and others um, didn't. Uh, Aaron O'Toole sort of played footsie with them, and other, uh, other politicians um, said they were wackos, and uh, Confederate flags, Nazi uh, swastikas, etc., um, defacing Terry Fox uh, uh, statue was completely inappropriate. And then, you know, liberals and NDP um, completely described them as wackos. What, yeah. What's the right strategy? I think it's missing the forest for the trees to recognize that there are, you know, it's not an easy co uh, country to govern, but ignoring them, labeling them, demonizing them is not a very smart thing to do. Look, um, I came from a riding that was considered pretty center right um, in its time, Ontario riding. Uh, we recognize that there are things that Canadians hold to be important, dear, which they treasure. doesn't matter what political spectrum or what part of the country they come from. I think that's the role of the federal government is to serve as an un, uh, you know, an undivided, put placing its undivided attention on ensuring that they, that they're, uh, you know, the, uh, the referee in the various conflicts that uh, might exist uh, regionally and otherwise uh, from coast to coast. Canada is not a melting pot. Uh, it is a very, you know, significant political, diverse group. And if you decide that it, the best way to address this is to exclude or to uh, minimize, um, then I think you're going to wind up with uh, less of a country and a federation uh, that is extraordinarily weak. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the weekend I didn't see so much as uh, you know, what had been anticipated. I mean, going into this long before it happened, the big news headlines were, oh, this is going to be violent. This is all about uh, right-wing extremism. You know, the same isn't said when we have a protest uh, on a different side of the political spectrum. If it's the left, it gets a pass. Uh, you know, uh, my, my biggest concern here is uh, that we're trying to pigeonhole everyone and uh, try to, you know, force a a square peg into a round circle and it's not going to work uh the problem for all of us is that uh, 
for all of us, I think, is that uh, we have to respect each other as Canadians and that there is going to be a diversity of opinion on some hot, hot issues. But at the end of the day, we will remain a united country. As long as we have people at the centre who understand that and don't exploit it, as I think, unfortunately, the federal Liberals and Cabinet have done. Damn it, Teg. Thank you very much for joining us and, uh, and sharing. Brian, it's been a pleasure. Thanks Good for having me today. That's and our show for tonight. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Good night.